Good morning. Our first reading this morning is from 1 John, Book 1, verses 5 to 10. It's found on page 1183 of the Red Pew Bible. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, Sorry. and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. This is the word of the Lord. This morning's second scripture reading from the Old Testament, from the book of Psalms. I'll be reading Psalm 51, the first two verses. This is a psalm of David, and David writes, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, Blot blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. May the Lord add his blessing. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would open up these scriptures to our hearts and our minds, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So folks, um, this morning, uh, before I actually get going here, I'm a little raspy because I've been dealing with a lot of allergy, and um, if I lose my voice, all is not lost. I will speak next week, okay? (laughs) This morning, I want to talk to you about a spiritual prayer for cleansing, and we could essentially reduce all of Psalm 51 to that. Uh, If you notice the superscription, uh, David is seeking God's forgiveness after committing adultery and murder. Now, if you read the account in 2 Samuel, you get the sense that it kind of happened bang, bang, but it really didn't. Uh, Probably like at least nine months lapse. And so David goes about his business, and he's just kind of going on and on and on. And, um, and then eventually, um, he's brought to conviction. We don't have time this morning to look at the whole psalm, but we um, intensely, uh, I would love to do that. Um, but I do want to look at verses 1 and 2 very intensively today. And I want to actually comment on the personal nature here of David's prayer. And I want to look at the structure. Now, uh, that might kind of bore some of you folks, but it speaks volumes to David's poetic ability. And as he understands God's character. And then finally, I want to, I want to look at the imagery of these verses as it pertains to forgiveness. Because that imagery follows over into the New Testament and speaks to the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross. Okay? So, um, notice that David's request here is intensely personal. Now, if you had committed adultery and murder, and you were a broken man or woman, you would have an intensely personal prayer as well. Uh, Now, uh, I want you to notice here that his words um, are not ritualistic. Uh, When you go into the Old Testament, you know, you had ceremonies and rituals. They had their place. 
they were necessary for form and function. They were essential for approaching the throne of grace. But, but these words here are anything but ritualistic. David is not going through the motions. He's not lip syncing. And, you know, kind of like, oh, you know, God, forgive me. You know, kind of like a, you know, a, a, um, a heart that's so divorced from what he's saying. Uh, this is not an emotionless confession. David's prayer here is heart to heart. As one scholar said, his prayer shows the stirrings of a distressed, conscious, guilty soul. Uh, I would say that most of us know what that is, right? That's why you're here this morning. God has convicted you of sin. Maybe you didn't commit murder. Maybe you didn't commit adultery, but you committed sin. And you were distressed at some point. And you were convicted. And you were conscious of that. And you felt guilty. That's why you're here. To put David's sin, or conviction of sin, in context. So David sins, and next thing you know, about nine months later, Nathan the prophet kind of wanders in. Uh, in. In the Old Testament Israel structure, you had the, the, you know, the priestly branch, you had the kingly branch that was the administrative, and you had the, the prophets. And, and so the prophets were the voice of God. They were kind of the Jiminy Cricket. And so Nathan comes in, and he, and he tells David this story of injustice. And he talks about how a poor man has one lamb, and how that lamb is kind of really more of a pet. And it kind of eats with the family, and it, it's everything to the kids. And yet this rich man has these visitors come in from town, and he's got all these lambs. And he decides, I'm not going to take a lamb from my uh, pen. I'm going to take the little poor man's lamb. And so Nathan tells this, this story, and David responds indignantly. 2 Samuel 12, read it sometime this afternoon or this week. And David wants justice done, and David, and, and, and David says, you know, that man should be put to death. Well, uh, Nathan says to David, David, you're, no, you're that man. And then he goes on to explain, um, you know, uh, the situation. And David knew it well. He, didn't, he, he was hiding it, right? This is what I want you to see here. This is more, this prayer here is more than a conviction by Nathan the prophet. Nathan is the outward instrument of God. But David's heart is awakened by the grace of God. It's the Holy Spirit that's within him. Later in Psalm 51, he says, Lord, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. That's because the Spirit of God came upon those in the Old Testament for administrative purposes, for prophetic purposes, for priestly purposes. He didn't tabernacle like he does with New Testament saints. And so, <clears throat> David here is awakened by the internal grace of God. He's convicted of his sin. And if you take a look at verse 2 here, and, and this is, you're not going to get this sense in the English, but trust me, this is what it is in the Hebrew. He's convicted of specific sins. In verse 2, he says, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. That means he's thinking of specific sins, the murder and the adultery. And by, by the way, if you think about this, David didn't only kill Uriah that day, because if you read the account, he told Joab to put Uriah in the foremost, hottest part of the battle and then withdraw your troops. Other fellow Israelite soldiers died that day along the side of Uriah too. So it's not Uriah's blood only that David has on his hands. So David's thinking of specific sins here. That's what the word iniquity means. But the word sin, at the end of verse 2, refers to the general state of the human condition. And so what's kind of passing before David is all of his sins. From the, from the earliest times of his childhood up to adulthood. And he, he thinks about being born in sin, verse 5. In sin my mother conceived me. He's thinking of his entire human condition. Being a fallen sinner before an almighty God. 
Uh, it's almost, as some one scholar said, he almost has an unceasing view of his sin. Gee, isn't that true? When you get close to God, don't you have an unceasing view of your sin? All the time. It's impossible not to. It's impossible not to. And, and yet, it's this sinful condition from, from the womb and these specific sins. David never, ever, ever let those sins keep him from approaching a gracious throne of grace. And there's a heartfelt spirit of repentance here. And when you start to, you, as you study the scriptures, you start to see it's the kindness of God, Romans 2, 4, that leads the heart to repentance. That's why you're sitting here today. It's not of your own doing. You didn't repent because you've decided, oh, I think I need God. It's the Holy Spirit of God working on your life and your heart and giving you that grace to come to Him. It's cradled to the grave of God drawing us. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, there's a godly sorrow that leads to repentance. It's of God. Anytime you have sin in your life, I have sin in my life. It's the mercy, mercy and the grace of God that leads us to repentance. Otherwise, except for the grace of God, there go I. We may be a, a, in a gutter someplace if he doesn't lead us to repentance. Now, as I read these verses, and I hope uh, as you read them too, uh, you'll be particularly struck with David's view and understanding of who God is. And this is, this is critically important because when you go into the Old Testament, right, you see a plurality of gods. You know, the Philistines had their gods and the Ammonites had their gods. You know, you had a, you had a god for everything, right? Often, the heathen views and the understandings of their gods were kind of made up as they went along. It's kind of like, you know, you ever sit down and you play a game, and you're, like, you're not really sure of the rules of the game, but you kind of make it up as you go along? David is not doing that with God. David understands God. God appeared to him. God revealed himself to him. David knows the Lord of glory. He knows because God had revealed himself to David. And that knowledge forms the basis of this personal request. It's no different than you or I bowing our heads and asking God to deliver us or to help us or to um, um, intervene divinely, knowing that he hears us. You do it because you know that he's gracious and good and that he answers. And, and this, so David's knowledge of God forms this personal uh, the nature of this personal request. And, and this, is, this, is what I, look, this is what I see here, uh, if I can kind of boil it. David is asking God's grace and mercy to be greater than all of his sin. Greater than the murder, greater than the adultery, greater than all the sins committed from the time that he came out of the womb. That's what, he's, that's what he's asking. It reminds me of the song, uh, what is it? Uh, grace that is greater than all of our sin. Grace, grace, God's grace, right? Greater than all of our sin. And, and he asks God for such a request because he knows God's able to. He knows that that's who he is. Take a look at the uh, image on the back of the bulletin. <clears throat> kind of cool. Doesn't come up real well, I guess. Maybe we need some new ink. Maybe it's not the best contrast. I want you to see the difference between grace and mercy. Because I've used those terms already, grace and mercy. There are two sides to the same coin. Uh, grace is when you get good things you don't deserve. That's grace. It's favor. It's blessing. Mercy is when you're spared the bad things you do deserve. Right? That's mercy. A God is generous with both. And that's what David is saying here. Uh, it's, it's what is undeserving that we're given. And it's what's withheld that is deserving. That's judgment. Right? 
And as I read these, David, in his life, he lived it, he received it. He, re, he lived the, the, the grace, and he received the mercy. He knew what it was. Now, when we take a look at uh, verse 2 here, the, the, the thoughts of grace and mercy are all about God's character and God's forgiving sin. And that's where I want to direct your attention to the structure here, because it, it's, it's huge. It speaks volumes. <clears throat> in verse in verse 1, um, what we have is, <clears throat> ver actually in verses 1 and 2, we have two sets of triads. Two sets of three, right? That's what we have. We have, be gracious according to thy loving kindness, according to thy great greatness of thy compassion. Now, if you're using an NIV Bible, it's going to have, have mercy. Um, it's a little bit misleading. The word gracious, be gracious, is the right word because it expresses grace, favor. Favor is a blessing. It's the idea of bestowing something. It speaks to, ultimately, the disposition of the heart. We'll talk about that in a little bit. <clears throat> According to thy loving kindness is... is um, is the better rendition because the NIV has your unfailing love. Here's the problem with the unfailing love. It seems to almost skirt the idea of mercy. But in the Hebrew, loving kindness is mercy. It's loving mercies. Uh, it's the, you know, remember that song, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever? It's loving kindness. That's what it is. And what that loving kindness does it bring, and mercy, it brings in a lot of other uh, character traits of God. We'll talk that, about that in a second. And, and then, of course, according to thy greatness and thy compassion. That's the first triad, all right? The second triad here, um, it, it's his request to deal with sin. And I want you to notice it's, it's expressed in various ways. Blot out, wash me, cleanse me. And all of those words are very specific, and they mean something. And I want to look at that. So, David understood the nature and the character of God as gracious, merciful, and forgiving. That's what comes out here. This is why he prays what he prays. But let's, let's consider the movement, or capture the movement, from grace to mercy to great compassion in the first triad. So, as I said... Uh, be gracious, it's the idea of bestowing favor or a blessing. It, it looks forward to mercy, but it's actually favor and blessing. That's what it means. It's to bestow something. Something that is not deserved. That's why we call it grace. And the intent, though, is loving kindness. The intent is mercy. That's why David uses these words very, very specifically. He recognizes God's favor as one thing that led to mercy. All right? Now, here's, here's the thing with the loving kindness here. The word is wrapped up in several features of, of God's character. Um, one scholar said God's truth, his faithfulness, his steadfastness, his justice, his righteousness, his goodness. They're all in play here. That's why you have... The NIV, I guess, use unfailing love as a catch-all. But loving kindness is probably the better interpretation. And here's the point. This word and all these character traits ultimately lead to God redeeming and delivering his people. That's at the heart of it. Uh, Jeremiah 31.3 says um, that he uses loving kindness to draw his people to himself. That's mercy. That's being God who he is. God being faithful and steadfast and just and righteous and good. They all come into play in terms of his character. Maybe it's a little bit easier to think of loving kindness in this way. I, I like this, this, this analogy. Think of, think of abundant mercy on steroids. That would be the way that you understand loving kindness. Amen? That's what it is. Uh, one scholar said, 
God's kindness is abundant, exceedingly great, without end, and good. And that's the God that we worship. Another way to think of loving kindness is think of it as like a measurement or a yardstick. Now, here's the problem. God can't be measured, right? Um, who can fathom the depths of his love, his grace, his mercy, his goodness, and the greatness of his person? No one. But if you think of loving kindness as a yardstick, a measurement, that's a good place to start. Um, Psalm 136. Read that sometime. Pick that up sometime this week. 26 times in that psalm, it uses the term loving kindness. And the sense here is that God's loving kindness seems to rule creation from heaven down to earth. It seems to be the, whole, the, 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 the thing that dominates in all of his dealings. It's a great, great word. The final, the final, th th uh, pi final, final thought of the first triad here. Thy compassion, uh, the greatness of thy compassion, or tender mercies. Um, what David is doing here, he is appealing to the warm embrace of God. Did you ever get, you ever, you ever embrace somebody and sometimes it's like, and other times it's like, a, uh, and you can feel the warmth of their body, right? And they hug you and they embrace you. I think that's what David is getting at here. Um, <clears throat> this word, and I don't want to go into all the nuances of it, but this word communicates, get this, the symbiotic relationship between mother and child in the womb. Folks, it doesn't get more intimate than that, now does it? Right? It's akin to the tender feelings and emotions of a mother carrying and caring for their child. It's internal. It's biological. It's symbiotic. You can't separate it. And that's the heart of God toward his children. His mercies are tender. His emotions are tender. His embrace is warm. It's visceral through and through. Everything that's in this chest cavity down to the abdomen is the internal parts. It's visceral through and through. And that's what David is saying here. It's a picture of God. You know, the, the, you know, uh, the picture of the mother, child, and God and his child. And that's how close it is. That's how deep it runs. Uh, David wrote in Psalm 139, How precious are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. That's the sense here. Now, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take the heart of this great saint that we've talked about and the heart of God and, and, and as put forth by David. And based on what has been written about God's character, how does God deal with the sin of his children? That's the question here, right? He blots out, he washes, he cleanses deeply. Now, I'm going to look at these three words because what they do is they give us a more comprehensive picture of ultimately what happens to our sin in Christ. Now, as a pastor, I can tell you, people have shared heart to heart with me through the years. They shared some things that I would never mention publicly from the pulpit about their failings and their shortcomings and their this and their that, right? And I've seen saints be so weighed down by their shortcomings and their sins. And they never seem to be like that little butterfly that breaks out of the cocoon and flies away. They don't, they're not free. They're not free. And yet everything that David writes here is about finding the freedom and the forgiveness in Christ and not letting specific sins hang over and not letting the human condition of sinfulness hang over for the rest of his life. And this is a beautiful, beautiful picture of what God does for anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. Anyone. And, and David expresses this so eloquently. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. And every single word here, and I'm going to go into this quickly, 
Every single word points to the cross of Christ. And it's so, so beautiful. So, so beautiful. It points to his actions and his blood and the cross and his ministry of reconciliation. Now, blot out. When was the last time you heard someone use the words blot out? Blot out. You know what? When was the last time you ever heard somebody use the word blot? Not, not, not recently, right? You've heard it, but if you've seen it, you've read it in Scripture. It's not one of these words that we use commonly. We just don't. Remember years ago when you used to have the little paper mate pens and the cartridges of ink? You know, and you had a blotter on your desk, you know, that would catch the ink. Or if you were using, we don't have anybody here that was using a quill and an ink fill, right? <laughs> we're not that old yet, right? But it's the idea that if you spill, you spill something, it's running, you, you blot. You, you, you kind of get, catch it up. I, I guess bounty, bounty towels might be kind of like the blotter, right? It's one of those phrases that's not used that much. Uh, let's, let's express it a little bit more modernly. It means to wipe out something. Wipe it out. And in fact, um, you wouldn't be surprised to find then that this term is associated with divine judgment, where God wipes stuff out, you see? Uh, by the way, didn't he divinely judge Christ at the cross to wipe out our sin? Uh, this term here is actually used in Genesis 7, verse 23. God, when God wiped out and he destroyed every living creature on the face of the earth that wasn't in the ark. That's what the word is. It's wiped out. Isaiah says in 43, verse 25, I, even I am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake. So David's, David's talking about wipeout. Isn't that the cross? Uh, listen to this. Colossians, 2, 4, uh, Colossians chapter 2, 13 and 14. Quote, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt, consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, wiped it out, having nailed it to the cross. It's wipeout. It's a canceling of the debt. It's blotting out. You know, if you owe me $300, it's using whiteout. You know, we blot it out and just kind of get rid of it. We wipe it out. That's what it is. But it's not only wipe out, it's wash out and white out. Uh, take a look at the next expression here. Wash me thoroughly. It's a wash out. Um, now, um, David's not talking about taking a bath here. This is not ceremonial cleansing. He's talking about the cleansing of his soul. And David is basically saying, get this, it's beautiful. David is basically saying, perform the work of a fuller. You know what a fuller is? It's an old, an old expression, right? It's a fuller. What's a fuller? Anybody know what a fuller is? Okay. Give it to you. A, a fuller is a professional, biblical laundry man. Come in and clean the dirty clothes. That's what David's saying. Perform the work of a fuller. A fuller in the Bible would take the raw, filthy wood from sheep and he would purify it through a variety of techniques and he would use really, really harsh soap. And in doing this, he would tread on it and he would knead it and he would beat it just to get all the impurities out. And it was a dirty job. It was an undesirable job. No one would really want to do it. But if you did, it was, a, it was income, right? It was a job. <clears throat> and it eventually led to clean wool. Now, ladies or guys, whoever does the laundry in your home, right? Uh, when you clean wool, what do you do? You run down to the dry cleaner, the fuller, the professional fuller. Um, or if you have cotton or another kind of fabric, you take the little tablet of Tide, 
right into the washing machine, right? Um, or you take the stain stick. Or as my wife does, the liquid stuff on our hands and knees and starts scrubbing. At least once a week, right, Jerry? To get the stains out. And here's the picture. It was dirty back then. It's not as dirty today, right? But if you look at it in context, David is talking about the removal of sin. Cleanse me from all of my sin. From the time of the cradle, from the time I've been a little kid all the way up. It's a moral dimension to it. And what does the Lord Jesus Christ say about doing this dirty job? I delight to do your will, O oh God. That's what he says. You ever watch the program Mike Rowe and Dirty Jobs? I don't know if it's still on. Maybe they're doing reruns. Man, there were some filthy, nasty jobs, right? Filthy, nasty jobs. Nothing more filthy, folks then removing the sins of the world and taking that muck and mire uh, upon himself. I delight to do your will, O oh God. Harold asked the question this morning, would you give your child up to do that dirty, filthy job? I wouldn't. Take a look at verse 7 real quickly because I want to pull verse 7 in. Um, David says, he uses the word hyssop, and he says, wash me. Uh, this is where the, the whiteout is captured, right? Um, wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. And, and, and it's interesting, when David brings the idea of hyssop in, it was what was used in ceremonial cleansing of lepers. And he sees his sin as so contagious as perhaps infecting the entire kingdom because... He did it in secret, and Nathan says it's going to be public. And that's what Absalom did. What David did in secret, Absalom made it public. And, and, and so what David is saying here is, as a leper needs physical cleansing and healing from his skin disease, David needs a deep spiritual cleansing of the heart. That's what he's saying. Some things are skin deep and some things are soul deep. And David's prayer is soul deep. I want to leave you with a final thought. <clears throat> Do you know that the Lord Jesus Christ is spoken of as the fuller's soap in Malachi chapter 3 verse 2? Malachi writes, Who can endure the day of his coming. And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's, like a fuller's soap. <laughs> the fuller picture of the biblical fuller, if I can put it that way, is the deep-seated cleansing of the soul, the removal of all of your sins, as far as my sins too, as far as the east is from the west, and it's through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, in answering Malachi's question, who can endure and who can stand? The answer is simple. He who has washed their garments in the blood of the Lamb. It's as simple as that. He who has called on the grace and the mercy of Almighty God. It's as simple as that. God's grace is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ to us. God's mercy is none other than Jesus Christ being our mercy seat, the propitiation of our sins in his blood as proper payment. So, let me share with you how a spiritual prayer for cleansing might read today. And it's pretty simple. Lord Jesus... In your great grace and abundant mercy, wash me and cleanse me of my sin. Be merciful to me, a sinner. Amen. Kind of like two verses, but it's very, very simple. It goes right back to the grace and mercy that God has provided 
in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we, as we transition to communion here this morning, this table represents God's great grace and God's great mercy. Uh, it represents the spiritual washing and the cleansing with the fuller soap. The only difference is it's not harsh. The washing has been done. Amen? That's what God has laid upon my heart. I hope you have a greater appreciation for these verses here. Uh, boy, I would love to do this whole psalm, but we'd be here till 9 o'clock tonight. Anyway, Scripture is so rich and so deep and so incredible. Uh, let's, let's pray. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, uh, thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ is the fuller soap. Uh, he's the fuller and he's the fuller soap. And he's washed us and he's cleansed us. And uh, Lord, um, the deep cleansing at Calvary. And yet, um, we still need to be washed in terms of fellowship and in terms of uh, the joy of our salvation. And we uh, thank you for the communion table, for what it represents. Uh, we pray that we would find great joy and great peace during this time. Uh, uh, your cleansing afresh uh, created me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.